Hey, ladies and gents, and welcome to the Controlled Interest Gamecast, episode 260. I am your host, Jared Weich. As always, I am joined by my indelible co-host, Dominic Orlando. Indelible? I don't even know that word. Wait, no, I do, because I used to think it was edible. <laughs> Inedible. <Not. laughs> you, I, yeah, I'm not calling you edible, thankfully. Um, yeah. I got I to gotta start off this way, just because, you know, it's every four years at the World Cup. USA! 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 You know, we don't... We don't get a cheer on our country far too often outside of, you know, funny enough, real quick, Dom, one of the arguments against the Uf, uh, UFC, the USA for the World Cup is like, oh, the only reason Americans don't care about soccer is because they're not good at it. They play a bunch of sports only they care about uh, with people. And that's, you know, we're not that's good flip. at it because we don't care about it or whatever. And then people forget yeah. to just go and Google <laughs> how many Olympic medals we have. Like far and away, we have the most Olympic medals. <laughs> it's not even close. So it's always been a weird argument. Anyways. Hopefully we win by the time this comes out. I think the Netherlands game versus the U.S. will be done. So hopefully we come out winners. But like I said before we started recording, Dom, we're in the knockout stage. It, we're playing with house money. <laughs> you know, we win. We're cheering them on forever. If we lose, eh, we weren't supposed to be this far anyway. So it's a good spot to be in. In the words of Gordon Bombay, we're Team USA, and we're going all the way. In some ways, do you think it's similar to if you were to see uh, the Lions play like in the playoffs in the next couple of years? It's like... Sure, you'd want him to win a Super Bowl, but at least they're in the tournament. Bar you know, with all of the not found success in the last, you know, the recent years. I guess. I mean, that comes into play more of like how dissatisfied you might be after if they lose. Yeah, you true. Know, how competitive they were in the expectations that game. are lower. Yeah, but you still want to win it just as bad. I think. Yeah, true, true. Uh, so maybe not exactly the same. Anyways, we've got an interesting show for you this week. We're going to be talking about the Game Awards. We're going to be predicting the award winners and then also saying who we want to win. So a little bit of a different thing there. And then we're going to be giving our predictions for the show. One thing I want to make note of at the top is that this is the last podcast we're doing for 2022. Uh, we're going to have a nice holiday break. Unfortunately, this isn't our day job. So, you know, we're, we're free to take breaks whenever we want. And, uh, I think it'll be nice to come back in January, go over not only our predictions for this, but our predictions for last year, even go over our Fantasy Critics League and see how we did there. Just kind of a, a big old wrap-up show for 2022. And then uh, one of the first podcasts I want us to do, too, as a maybe a bonus uh, podcast, is our spoiler cast for God of War Ragnarok. I think that'll be really dope. So, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy this episode, and then we'll see you guys in the new year. But let's get into it. we got a couple of news stories before we hit the Game Awards section, Dom. So we're going to start off with, uh, it turns out people love Pokemon, Dom. Uh, sales reports came out and <laughs> a little bit. Scarlet and Violet sold 10 million copies in the first three days, which is absolutely wild. And it's one of those cat's paw things of the game itself is, and I'll talk about this later when we talk about what we've been playing is because I've spent some time with it, is it's a lot of the evolutions, wink, wink, that people have wanted in a Pokemon game, but it came with all of the performance issues and bugs. Thankfully, I haven't experienced many of the bugs. I've had one crash in my entire time playing it, which kind of caught me by surprise. And I haven't had any of the weird, like, uh, bugs where people are, like, halfway in the ground or Pokemon are halfway in the ground. Mine's pretty much just been performance-based. Um, but I've kind of gotten used to that with a lot of Switch games, so it's not impacting me too much. Like, I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, my God, it's running at you know, 20 frames a second. I haven't had the crazy stuff where it's like running at one second or my, the polygons and characters are shifting into interdimensional space beings. But man, 10 million copies is nothing to sneeze at. And it's funny because, you know, as well as something like God of War Ragnarok is selling, this just shows why Pokemon continues to be one of the biggest franchises in the world. Sells like hotcakes, regardless of the mixed reviews on this game, people are going to go out and buy it. And, uh, yeah, it's 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 not surprising, but it is still wild at the same time, right? It it is, and there is that I did see that they committed to, you know, fix putting out some patches to get it fixed up as much as they can, which is good. Obviously, you hope for that, which not exactly incentivized to do so when you're <laughs> exactly. still selling off the shelf. But yeah, that's like wild, um, especially like like we compared to you know God of War brag bragging. Ragnarok bragging about having sold five million copies in the same amount of time, and and that's pretty impressive too. Also an exclusive, but then Pokemon just doubles it like it's no big deal. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think they're pretty comparative simply for the fact that God of War Ragnarok came out on both platforms, 
So if you add the PS4 and PS5 sales, I'm pretty sure it's very similar to that of the Nintendo Switch, right? I'd assume, give or take. Mm, okay. So I think that's pretty comparative. Maybe we'd have to crunch the numbers, yeah, but it's like, not like far just... off. Hmm. Yeah. So there's as many switches as there are PS4s and fives. That, I mean, there's probably less switches, but not that many less. Well, and... it's close enough. I don't. I don't know though, because didn't the Switch become one of the best selling? Uh devices oh did it did it pass ps4 i didn't think it did but maybe i'm i don't know i i, I might be talking out of my ass if i'm being completely honest but still i think it's more comparative than people would assume because i think a lot of times people think of god of war ragnarok as like a ps5 game um but it did come out on the previous gen as well so i think it's pretty comparative if not more impressive because yeah may, i think maybe the ps4 ps5 numbers are more than the switch so it just shows those attachment numbers for pokemon man people it's crazy to think about. Imagine if Pokemon was multi-platform, how much it would sell. Yeah, yeah that'd be absolutely Plus ludicrous. They have that... I'd be curious, too. I don't expect it to be that many, but how many? what percentage of people who buy each Pokemon game buy both versions, right? I don't know if it's that high, like... especially in the day with, like, internet infrastructure and being able to trade through that and stuff. Um, oh, good point. But yeah... Maybe, like, 5% of people bought both. Something like that. Maybe not that many. Yeah, or the people who have multiple kids who just buy the bundle and get one for each, too. That's also a thing, right? Yeah. So, yeah, but really cool. Impressive, nonetheless. Next up, uh, a, a dope piece of news for PlayStation. I label this one Adapt or Die or Not. Uh, Sifu live action film is in the works. This was announced this morning, the day of recording, which is December 2nd. And it's in the works by John Wick creator Derek Kolstad, which is pretty dope. I think that's a perfect matchup. Uh, if you've seen any gameplay for Sifu, it definitely gives off that close, tight action movie vibe of, uh, you know, the hallway scenes from Daredevil or even, obviously, John Wick. So I think that's a perfect pairing for the director. Um, and I do think this is something where, you know, we often talk about, Dom, are adaptations worth it? Are they justified? Do we need games to be turned into live action stuff? We obviously talked about it at length for stuff like Last of Us uh, and other properties. With Sifu, I think this is perfect because when people play that game, they love the gameplay and the atmosphere, but no one's talking about, oh my god, the story is great. And I think adapting it to live action in a movie can take it to the next level where you actually provide that strong narrative in addition to all the dope environmental and combat stuff that the game has provided, right? Yeah, and it's kind of like one of those things too where it makes me think of Every new movie we see, it's kind of like you find out later on, like, oh, that was based on a book, or that was based on, you know, whatever it was that was old, and you just never knew about it. Yeah, um, seems like a lot of stuff is just not entirely original. Like it's just more common than we might think. And so why not? That if we're gonna do that, you know, do it for games a lot. Like if there are original games, or you know, that can inspire, you know, cool adaptions. Like. Yeah, why not? And I think I didn't I didn't hear about this till just now, but yeah, I think Sifu that could be pretty cool. I didn't play that game, um, but I could abs- I could definitely see that being a cool movie, especially with the creator of uh, John Wick. That kind of like just makes sense. It's like, oh, I see yeah. that pairing. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting because you know I think the big thing with producing live action stuff is it's a risk, and anybody in Hollywood would tell you that these producers and these uh, just production companies in general would rather take a chance on a known quantity than a new IP. They often say that new IPs are the hardest thing to get greenlit in Hollywood. Um, and that's why everything is based on a movie or any of that stuff. And that's why they say right, that uh, co- the comic route is really huge for IP because uh, studios are much more willing to take an established comic book that's already created, regardless of how successful it is. Obviously, the more successful it is, the more likely it is to be turned into something. But just the fact that it already exists they're way more comfortable with that than creating a new IP from scratch, which is really interesting. Mm-hmm. So we'll see what happens. This sounds dope, and I can't wait to see uh, what it looks like because, you know, they turned John Wick, a single action movie, into a pretty big franchise. And I do think Sifu, we, we don't really have, like, a major martial arts uh, franchise currently. Uh, I've, we haven't really had one, honestly, since the days of, like, Bruce Lee and, and even Jackie Chan's Golden Era, so... It'd be nice to see that come back. And I think Sifu is a cool enough property that they could do that, especially with the creatives they have attached. Uh, Next up, I labeled this one, we need an attorney. Uh, So 
During an interview at Milan Games Week, yeah, that's a thing, which I didn't know. I know about Milan, like, Fashion Week and stuff. I didn't know there was a Games Week, but, you know, the biggest entertainment medium in the world, it's going to happen. Which, it's so funny to think about people, like, high fashion people in Milan talking about video games. It just cracks me up. Uh, accomplished voice actor Troy Baker, because, of course, Troy would be in Milan, because who else, where else would he be? Uh, uh, it seems like his kind of place. Exactly. Super fashionable. Uh, about wanting to show the character of Daredevil the same love in the video game medium that he had received in Charlie Cox's portrayal of the character in live action. He actually went on afterward to say that he would love to either direct a Daredevil game or take on the role of the character. Uh, you know, previously talking about Daredevil in the sense of, you know, the hallway scenes and how dope that is. I do think he's a character that is very viable for video games, Dom. He doesn't have the Superman issue, right, where he's overpowered like crazy. He offers some unique mechanic opportunities in terms of him being blind and echo location and all that stuff. Um, you know, he is melee combat focused, so that can add to a really nice combat system. And uh, I, I don't really want to focus too much on Trey Baker's comments because I want to more talk about, like, what would you want out of a Daredevil game? But in his comment of, like, I'd rather, I, I want to direct or star in one, as much as I think Troy Baker would kill the role of Daredevil, I wouldn't question that. He's a very phenomenal talent. I'd be much more curious in him directing it because he has had so much experience in the medium that I'd like to see him in a different role and see how he affects a video game product in that way. Um, but yeah, it, I don't know if you have anything to mention about that, but more curiously, what would you want or, or expect out of a Daredevil game? I don't know because that's trickier to me. Um, because he he doesn't quite. You're gonna have to correct me as I'm wrong here and kind of speaking out of ignorance, but obviously, you know, tight like hand to hand combat, right? Kind of like a Sifu, something like that, or an Arkham game. But what does Daredevil kind of have as far as other abilities or gadgets or other things like that you can use to like kind of make that gameplay? So detective vision would probably be huge because it can hear people's heartbeats from a distance. Yeah. Um, okay. That'd be cool. Yeah. I it I think I'd be curious to see if my dream Daredevil game would be a perfect mix of Arkham combat and approach with uh, uh like a classic Tom Clancy stealth because I think if you can merge those two things together where you have moments of tense uh stealth gameplay where you're trying to get through areas unnoticed and then you also mix that with combat arenas where you can show off combos and stuff like that I think it'd be really fun. Uh, you have opportunities to have other characters enter the mix and play as them. Uh, but the big thing, too, to make this wholly unique, Dom, is I would love if the game went from you being Daredevil to you being Matt Murdock. Like, I'd love if you were, it was like uh, Ace Attorney yeah. where you were in the court and part of the game was you being an attorney and solving cases. I think that'd be really cool, too. Um, so what if this is then, yeah, because I, my, my, my baseline was like an Arkham game, right? But let's like let's scrap that and instead this isn't gonna be like an open world game. This is gonna be a really linear, um, kind of like more zoomed in kind of game, right? Like an uncharted or something like that. Um so like really focus on that combat, like feeling really good and really tight instead of just, you know, having to throw in a bunch of different abilities and um ways to traverse the world and all that kind of stuff. So like really focus on that, but then I'm extremely, extremely focus on the narrative and the cinematic kind of like feel of it. And then that I think make it easy even easier to do something like you're talking about is include some kind of cool uh, you know, dialogue stuff in, in a courtroom and, you know, talking with clients or interrogations or what I don't even know. Um I think we're on to something. So let's not publish this podcast, but instead let's pitch this to <laughs> whoever body dog or whoever um uh, a a neat idea uh, i have you mentioning that is yeah not open world make it like level based but a cool thing you could do Mm -hmm. to implement the stealth is that me and you could both play through the same level and it has the same ending but from point a to point b depending on how stealthy you are the route you take how careful you are with things you can gather more or less information for a relevant court case Mm -hmm. so when you get to that court case you have all the information you've gathered, but if you're somebody who doesn't like stealth gameplay, you have less to work with. You still have an ability to be successful in the court case, but if you take your time and approach things a certain way, you can build stronger evidence for it. That comes to like hearing like stuff, that comes to finding evidence, all of that. I think that'd be really cool. So yeah, one dictates really cool. the other. Like 
the court cases yeah. you need to pay attention to because you need to know what you're looking for, what you need to hear about. And then the actual uh, Daredevil gameplay, you need to be careful with the way you approach things because you know that can have a drastic effect on how successful you can be in the court side of things. And having those play off of one another, I think, is really cool. Everything you just said actually is... um. They kind of do exactly that in Knights of the Old Republic because I just obviously I just played through that earlier this year and um totally like different kind of game setup there obviously but they do do that where going through this whole world this whole planet you're on going through all these different quests gathering different evidence um you have tons of different ways to approach it and things you can discover and things you can learn through different methods that all impact how a court case plays out and how you present the evidence and stuff like that and it was one of my favorite parts of that game so i think you're onto something i guess is what i'm saying well and the cool thing is i think it really opens it up for expansions post-release too of where you can you can release a case that's solely focused on a certain villain like a kingpin case or something and because it's more level based and not open world based you can kind of handcraft those and have like a cool expansion come out afterwards that maybe follows up the main story of the game i think it'd be really cool i i, I want that because yeah, if it was just a combat-focused game, you know, I don't want Arkham with a Daredevil skin. I want something that feels right. exactly. distinctly Matt Murdock, and that is crafting the court side of things with the Daredevil side of things. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. That's our pitch. No one take it. Copyright, TM, trademark, all that good stuff. <laughs> uh, now we're going to be talking about the Game Awards. We're going to be predicting it. So this year saw the release of incredible games spanning various genres, from developers around the world. We're going to take a look at Epic 12 categories, and we're going to predict which game will win the award and also explain which one we'd like to win if we had a a dog in that specific fight. So to make it clear, our predictions are only counted for the games we think we're going to win. So we're going to be predicting, you know, game of the year, this game is going to win. If it doesn't, we don't get a point. When we talk about what we want to win, that has nothing to do with the predictions. We're just saying, like, I hope this wins. You know what I mean? Just a little bit extra conversation there. So the 12 categories I brought up, and we're also going to do predictions afterward, are most anticipated, best adaptation, best multiplayer, best action adventure, best role playing, best indie, best performance, best score and music, best art direction, best narrative, best game direction, and game of the year. I left out a lot of the esports stuff and a lot of the less, I wouldn't say relevant, but I think these are the 12 most core award categories. And then uh, in, term, in, in case we get a tie, I have a tiebreaker that I'll explain when we get there. And uh, we can also mention if we feel something has been left out of the award, like a big snub. Um, but let's get into it. First up, I want to start with most anticipated. This one's a fan voted one. This one's one that can go in numerous different directions because who knows. The nominees are Final Fantasy 16, Hogwarts Legacy, Resident Evil 4 Remake, Starfield, and The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Now, this one is tricky because I honestly think it's a two game race between. Starfield yep. and The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Yep, that's what I was thinking too. <laughs> I think you can cross out uh, Hogwarts just because uh, yes. there's enough people that don't like J.K. Rowling. And as far as anticipation goes, that's an easy one to not anticipate. It could not. be a dark horse because there's a lot of Harry Potter fans. And it's a general... It's weird with people who vote on this because they're not necessarily the hardcore of hardcore, but they're not so general that they don't know what the game awards are. So that's kind of weird. Mm-hmm. I, I do think Final F- Fantasy 16 is out of the question because that is more niche than the rest of them. And Resident Evil 4, b- it being a horror yeah. game, also is more niche than the rest of them. Uh, yeah, I do agree that Hogwarts yeah. Legacy is out of the running. It's tough, though, because if there was a From Software game on this list, I'd pick that no matter what because that fan base is more fervent than any. Um, I would say The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is more highly anticipated generally especially with hardcore audiences but people have been waiting so long for a mainline bethesda rpg to release especially following fallout 76 i think starfield is gonna win but i want legend of zelda to win but i I do think it's gonna be starfield yeah i i thought starfield too um because i think but first of all both of these games were in this category last year (laughs) yeah (laughs) so <clears throat> it's kind of funny to point that out but legend of zelda is this is a it's not even like typically a new legend of zelda game is a new game but this one is specifically a sequel to breath of the wild which is they've done that before but not they don't typically um 
So a sequel in terms of like, you know, marketing and sales is going to make it more anticipated and, you know, it's going to help it sell more. But when this is voted just by like, you know, gamers logging into the Game Awards site and voting, I think um, the new IP, the newness of Starfield makes this more anticipated to me. Whereas, I mean, Tears of the Kingdom, it even looks, you know, the same exact art style as Breath of the Wild. You know, not that that's a negative uh, in how we might perceive the game when it's out, but for like most anticipated Starfield is like, dude, you're telling me we have, we have Elder Scrolls, we have Skyrim in space, you know, that's, that's the pitch, right? Um, distilled down into, you know, the most basic way, but that's exciting. And I think uh, Starfield wins. I guess I could look up who won it last year and that might be a good indicator, but I I thought, I think Starfield wins too. And I hope it does. The thing here is, <sighs> If Starfield was multi-platform, I think it'd far and away easily be the choice. The fact that it's exclusive, I don't know how salty PlayStation fans are going to be. Not that Xbox fans aren't salty, but you know what I mean. But Legend of Zelda is also exclusive. So it's like, well, (laughs) that's a weird thing to me. Why isn't Marvel Spider-Man 2 on this list? It's a great question. Yeah, how did they get this list? Uh, Yeah, well, maybe because I don't know if... I thought Marvel Spider-Man was... At least, like, dated for 2023, but I couldn't be wrong there. I thought so, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of who you want to win, uh, who is, is, is that? Led- this one's, like, want is weird because it's, like, anticipated. I'm anticipating all these games, but it's yeah. whatever. I'll say I'm most anticipating Starfield, maybe. Yeah. Is a better way to I say. wonder if the delay plays a factor, too, of, like, people already expecting to already play this game by now, so the delay gets them more anticipated for it. Whereas we've waited so long for even the title of Legend of Zelda that I think people are like, okay, the date's there. And with Nintendo, Nintendo rarely delays Zelda. So after the date's announced, am I right with that or am I wrong? Like a specific date, not like a loose. That's weird. Uh, There's just not as many examples for them, frankly. (laughs) We don't have that many Zelda games that exist. But I I never think that like, Okay, it's March twenty fourth, and then it gets delayed. I I know it gets delayed like year to year, or like spring twenty twenty something mm-hmm. to like fall. But when there's when they nail a specific date, I don't. I can't imagine the last time they rarely moved. It's like Pokemon in that way. Um, next up, one of my favorite categories that maybe wouldn't have been the case five years ago. Dom, best adaptation. This is obviously adapting, as we talked about earlier with Sifu. This is adapting video games to other mediums uh obviously tvs and movie so the first one is arcane obviously league of legends adaptation we got cyberpunk edge runners we got the cuphead show we got sonic the hedgehog 2 and we got uncharted now i think there's no way uncharted wins this <laughs> i think that's far and away yeah. the most divisive thing on this list even though it's arguably the most and eh, league of legends is more popular than uncharted but it's pretty popular in terms of a franchise the thing that sucks here is I've only seen Arcane. I saw the first Sonic the Hedgehog movie. I'm excited to watch the second one. Haven't got around to it. I love Cuphead. Haven't got around to watching the Cuphead show that I heard it's good. And Cyberpunk Edge Runners. People are saying it's one of the best anime of the year, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, and it's from Studio Trigger. If you're familiar with anime, they're a very highly respected uh, animation studio. For me personally, I want Arcane to win. Uh, and also I think it's going to win because it really comes down to arcane and cyberpunk for me in terms of it needs to be a show that even outside of it being an adaptation is critically acclaimed and arcane is one of the best shows I've ever seen animated live action adaptation or not. It is incredibly well crafted. The characters are great. It is the best part of an adaptation in that if you didn't know it was based on league of legends, it, or you did, it doesn't make a difference. Like, the world just exists on its own. It's so well-crafted. It has such a beautiful, unique art style. Um, yeah, I, I've, I'm putting my money on Arcane on this one, though I think it might be closer uh, than people might expect in terms of competition. I think it's important It's important to point out, so now we're moving into it's not just fan-voted for this one. Like exactly, yeah. Anticipated way. So... Um, because if it were, I'd say Sonic could have a chance. Oh, for sure. Because a lot of people love, <laughs> you know, if we're talking about volume of fans, then I think Sonic could get in there. But otherwise, Cuphead is really cool. It's like just a really well-made show. I'm not. They they're on their third season. They just put out, by the way. Like they're they're continue to crank out more episodes of that stuff, and it's um, it's pretty cool. But 
I'm with you 100%. Arcane is, to me, hands down the best adaption on this list and maybe the best adaption of a video game thing ever. It's everything about it is, is I, I don't know, I can't, I couldn't find anything wrong with it if I had to. And I, I just adored the shit out of it. So I hope it wins and I think it will. I think the only criticism that show ever gets is from people who don't like Imagine Dragons that they're in the show. Uh, but other than that, it's such a weird nitpick too. Um, Skip the intro. Exactly. Well, no, remember they're actually in one of the episodes, uh, like as a band in the bar. You remember that? Okay. Yeah. I and I think one of the like, this one of their songs does play uh, like in the background at one point in the show too. Yeah. But oh see, God. to your point, you didn't even know they were in that episode. So it's it's only people trying to be haters that notice that. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But I, I do want to – everything on here uh, other than Arcane, I want to get to except for Uncharted. I don't know if I ever – I love Tom Holland, but I hate Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> so it's like a very mixed thing for me. It's, it's, not, it's not bad. You know, it's not like a bad movie. It's worth, you know, when it comes to it. Actually, I think it's on Netflix. It's worth throwing on, like, just for, for fun. I just um, don't like Mark Wahlberg, honest, man. <laughs> yeah, and, like, Tom Holland, I don't know. Like, it's not it's not my favorite thing he's been in. I guess I'll say that. Like, I, I, I kind of like uh, Nathan Drake in the games uh, a bit more. Not necessarily his fault, um, but it's still, it's still a decent movie. I mean, it was a weird you casting like the games, from the though. get-go, for being honest. Very weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, decide you know tries to go with the younger one and whatever anyways uh best multiplayer so we have call of duty modern warfare 2 multiverses overwatch 2 splatoon 3 teenage mutant ninja turtle shredders revenge um wait on best adaptation arcane was for both right what you thought was going to win and what you hope wins yeah okay yeah so for this one i think it's very easily uh very easy to throw out multiverses cool game very niche not going to win um Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge, I think, is a dope nod. I don't know if it... This is one I could see winning because the industry is voting on it, and I know a lot of the industry loves those classic TMNT arcade games because the quality is there. It's a very quality game, but who knows? Splatoon 3 is a weird one. Overwatch 2 is a weird one. And then I don't know how many people in the industry are actually going to vote for Modern Warfare 2. Uh, This one's actually pretty tough, honestly. I I think it could go a number of ways. Based on how I believe the industry will vote, I think Splatoon 3 is going to win. I think it's going to be a split vote, and Splatoon 3 is going to edge out a couple of the other ones. I think there's way too much controversy over Overwatch 2, not only from the Activision standpoint, but why it exists. Like, it doesn't seem different enough for it to even actually exist. Why does it have a 2 instead of it just being a new update? I think Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles might be too small scale, unfortunately. And then Modern Warfare 2, I just don't know how many people in the industry are voting for it. So I'm going to go Splatoon 3, I think, wins. I want TMNT to win, though. I'm pulling for the little darling. I think (laughs) this one I'm just too ignorant on to make a super educated guess, but I do think Call of Duty wins. I think they pull it out because I feel like I've been seeing that people really like this one. But maybe I could be totally wrong. <laughs> I feel like I've at least seen a couple of tweets or something. I don't know. Um, at least compared to you know the previous Call of Duty games, typically, I mean, give it a month late, and we'll see where people on. sit. You know what I mean? <laughs> it might be a bit different. True. Yeah. And the, and this category is just so odd because yeah, I don't love Overwatch because it. I didn't even know that that came out. I because of kind of what you said, like when people are still playing Overwatch and it's the same as it was, and I, I don't know. That's just odd to me. Multiverse is like, actually, I, okay. <laughs> I hope multiverse wins because that would be funny, and it's such a weird thing that that exists. Um, I, Free to play multi-platform yeah, Smash I, Brothers, man. Yeah, and it's like Smash Brothers just makes so much more sense to me. Like that combination of that group of characters, right? Like Nintendo, they feel more more cohesive. Uh, like they belong together. But well, the multiverse people like, like you got Shaggy and Batman right in the front with a thumbnail for it. It's just hilarious. So I hope that wins. Just um, uh, to be a troll. But it's the I most noticeable Game of Thrones game we've ever gotten. Arya Stark's in it. Oh yeah, because like <laughs> Arya Stark is in there too. Oh man. So yeah, I I hope multiverse wins, but I think it'll be Call of Duty. Okay, so we're split on that one. Cool. Next up, best action adventure. We have a Plague Tale Requiem, which I want to get to stuff and played unfortunately. God of War Ragnarok, Horizon Forbidden West, Stray, Tunic. 
Uh, I think it's going to be God of War Ragnarok, but I'd love to see a Plague Tale Requiem win. I don't know if there's much else to add there. I just, I think God of War Ragnarok has a good chance to win most of the categories it's in. Unless it's going against Elden Ring, then it's like a 50-50. So. Yeah, this one to me is just like, um, it's just a no-brainer. It's like, it's the most obvious, uh, easiest choice. I think God of War does win. And and I want it to. I think it deserves it out of, you know, for this category, it makes the most sense. And I've, uh, th- this is actually a better year for me than usual because in this category, I've played four of these games. <laughs> so I feel uh, more, you know, qualified to make some of these uh, choices in some of these categories, this being one. So yeah, I'll say God of War. Uh, Next up, best role-playing game. Elden Ring, Live Alive, Pokemon Legends Arceus, Triangle Strategy, Xenoblade Chronicles 3. What I'll say on this is if Pokemon Scarlet and Violet didn't come out, Pokemon Legends Arceus, I think, would have a fun chance. But, as I'll talk about later when we talk about what we've been playing, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet took everything with Arceus, and it's totally clear that Arceus was a test bed, a beta, for what Scarlet and Violet would be. Uh, Live a Live is cool, but it's very retro. I don't think I get enough votes. Uh, this is Elden Ring. It's like I said before, any category yeah. Elden Ring is in is going to win unless it's going against God of War Ragnarok. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be Elden Ring, clearing away. And I, I, my, my heart wants Arceus to win just because I love Pokemon so much, but obviously I'm not going to be upset if Elden Ring wins because I absolutely adore Elden Ring. Yeah, Elden Ring for sure is going to win. Um, can you can count on that. I actually really, I think I, I would like for Xenoblade to win because I've not played it. I'm not playing any Xenoblade games, but I know that people love the shit out of this Xenoblade Chronicles 3 game. And Elden Ring is going to win, you know, at least a few other awards besides this. And so I hope that, you know, the and frankly, Xenoblade is to me maybe a little bit more of a purely defined RPG compared to Elden Ring, which you could you could call almost argue is more of an action game or an action RPG. Xenoblade, I think it's just an RPG through and through. Um, I don't care to get into semantics of that <laughs> anymore. Yeah. But, um, I just, I don't know. I just hope that, you know, those, those fans get a win with Xenoblade. Cause it feels like it, this is the category where it can win. And I know people love the shit out of it, but I don't, I don't think it could actually pull it off, but yeah. If Elden Ring didn't exist, I think Xenoblade would clearly win this category. It'd yes. be my second choice yes. easily. Um, next up, best indie. I want to talk about a snub real quick. Why is Tinykin not on this list? I'm super pissed off. I cannot believe Tinykin is on this oh. list. So that was where you're you're very small in the bedroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one where you have like the little like uh, it's like Pikmin kind of. Yeah, absolutely adored that like game. Pikmin cross with Toy Story. Sort of deal. Yeah, and I don't even know if it'd win or if it deserves to win, but I just think it deserves the nod in this category but the nominees are cult of the lamb neon white sifu stray and tunic um the scary thing for me on this one is that strain is in so many categories way more than i'd expected to that it leads me to believe that this yeah. one might be a much stronger of a contender in this category than i would originally anticipate um for me, I think it's between Stray, Sifu, and Cult of the Lamb. I know people like Neon White, but I think it's far too niche. And same thing with Tunic. I think Tunic was highly anticipated, but I don't know if it met expectations. And we're thinking about an award show where like Death's Door didn't even get recognition. And, and to me, Death's Door is a better version of Tunic. Uh, so I think it really comes down to Stray, Sifu, and Cult of the Lamb. Going back to what I said about Stray, Cult of the Lamb really isn't anything else either, so I don't think it's going to get a whole lot of love. So it really comes down to Sifu and Stray, and for me, I think Stray is going to win, but I want Sifu to win, because I, I love what Sifu is in terms of a very fresh and unique gameplay experience. Not that Stray isn't either, but, you know. Yeah, this category is more fun than the past few where it was obvious who the winner will be, but... I really hope that Stray wins because I really love that game, but I don't think it will. I do think I think Cult of the Lamb wins. Okay. Like, I'm trying to think back to you know how a lot of you know reviewers and people you know the different gaming outlets they all really loved Cult of the Lamb, um, and Stray was more like it's a good game, you know. But it was also a little bit divisive. There was a small vocal crowd of people who didn't like Stray too. Yeah, 
and you know and i can and i get it because it's a little it's basic in some ways and it's you know um it, it excels and it's like atmosphere and charm i think more than anything so if it didn't hit for you like it, basically if you replace the cat with any any other animal that wasn't as cute or something um it's just the most basic puzzle game and it wouldn't be that cool but um i really adored it i hope it wins but i do think cult of the lamb actually does instead it's a very good point i think with sifu 2 specifically it might not have a chance solely because of the genre and the difficulty uh, which could hold it back, but point. yeah, I yeah. actually I'm changing. I'm not changing quite. I think it's gonna win. I still think it's gonna be straight. But in terms of who I want to win, I think I want Call of the Lime to win, because that was really dope. Shout out to Tinykin too. Uh, next, the best performance we have Ashley Birch in Horizon Forbidden West. Shout out to Ashley. Uh, Charlotte McBurney in A Plague Tale Requiem. Christopher Judge in God of War Ragnarok. Man Engage in Immortality, and Sunny Suljic in God of War Ragnarok. Uh, so. Christopher Judge won this last when uh, the original God of War came out. So not that he can't win it twice, oh, okay. but I do think... I'm glad you mentioned this. Yeah. Sonny Soljic, uh, his portrayal as Atreus is good, but to, I, I don't know. For me, it really comes down to Ashley Birch and Manning Gage. I haven't played Immortality, um, but from what I've seen of it, it's a game that's on my list to play. The performance, she actually... She does a full body performance, like live action performance, and I'd say that's better than just vocal acting, but I do think it deserves to also be appreciated for what she did in that game. Uh, you know, they basically film like multiple full length movies essentially for people to investigate. Uh and with Ashley Birch, she's done so much great work in the industry with so many characters, and I do think she's a big reason why Aloy came to life in the way she did, both in the first game and the sequel. And I do think Horizon Forbidden West, because of God of War Ragnarok, is going to get overshadowed in a lot of categories where they're both up for the same award. Um, and with Christopher Judge winning it when God of War came out, I do think that Ashley Birch has a much more likely chance of winning it. Uh, so I'm going to say Man Engage, I think, is going to win it. And I think Ashley Birch is my pick that I hope wins it. I This, this one is tough for me. Um... Because it's hard to, because now like we're really trying to get into what are what are where people's heads at when they're voting on this stuff. Because yeah, are they going to try to do makeup votes? Kind of like you're saying, well, Christopher Judge won it last time, so like maybe we go for Ashley here. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm not not even to say that that's not necessarily. And fair part of the reason he won too is because he but... like reinvented that character completely. Whereas now we're seeing yeah. more of that reinvented character, if that makes sense, as opposed to the drastic change we witnessed. And so, for me, Horizon Forbidden West was really was great, and Ashley did a great job. But it wasn't didn't di differentiate itself that much from the original. So yeah, uh, I, I I think Christopher Judge wins again, um, because he does even more um, than in the first game. Like Kratos evolves even further. Uh, I don't want to spoil things for you or anybody else, but um, and in his performance, like it's just such a weird character to try to play, and you're doing that gravelly voice for the most part, but then like you're still trying to like use that to express emotions in different ways, and I don't know. I think what he did in that game was just like it's like next level. Like it's not, it's like way less volume. Like he doesn't even have as many lines. Like probably he has like twenty percent of the lines that Ashley has in Horizon, I would bet, you know, something like that. But they're just it's just so impactful what what he specifically does um for that character. But I got to give a shout out too cuz Sunny is really good, especially when you see um the how he's playing Atreus in Ragnarok compared to the first game. It's like totally different character. I mean, he grew up um and it and that's like really well displayed and well executed to to show that, but I think Christopher Judge wins, and I hope he does. So I'm going with him on both counts. And the thing we didn't mention, too, is so Atreus plays a much larger role in this game. There's, you know, this isn't, yes. I wouldn't consider this a spoiler, but there's sections of this game where you even play as Atreus without Kratos. Um, and to me, that, that, the way I look at it is if people took God of War Ragnarok as the best performance they played this year, 
the interesting idea I have is I wonder how many of those votes are split between Christopher Judge and Sonny, right? Of people are going to vote for one right. or the other. Yeah. So those two splitting votes can mean that somebody else wins too um, because they both did such a tremendous job. Um, and also, shout out to Once. Charlie McBurney. Neither of us have experience with the Plague Trail Requiem, and I don't want to yeah. you know, throw her to the wayside. I just don't know yeah. how her performance was, so apologies. And once you once you've completed God of War, I'll tell you uh, who else from that game I think was totally snubbed here. Um, but it makes sense. But yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, next up, best score in music. We have a uh, Plague Tale Requiem, uh, which was done by Olivier Deravi. Uh, we have Elden Ring, which was done by Sukasa Saito. Uh, we have Bear McCreary for God of War Ragnarok. We have Two Feathers for Metal Hellsinger, and we have Yusinori Mitsuda for Xenoblade Chronicles Three. Uh Shout out to Metal Hellsinger for getting on this list. I think most people looked at the game and were like, oh, they just licensed a b- <clears throat> excuse me. They just licensed a bunch of tracks and put it in the game. No. They got these vocalists and made original music for the game, which is super cool. Yeah. Um I think it's that would be the one I want to win just because of what it is. Uh but to me it's a two person race between Elden Ring and God of War Ragnarok. One of the most beautiful moments in gaming, not even just this year, but I've ever experienced is starting Elden Ring, hearing that loud ass opening theme. Because if there's one thing from software does, it makes the, the, the menu music loud as hell. Uh, but you start the game, you play 70 to 100 hours, you get to the final boss and you hear the boss theme. That's a remix version of the Elden Ring theme. And it's one of the most incredible pieces of music in a video game. Just the epic stage it feels like you're in i don't know it it's incredible um obviously i haven't done as much in god of ragnarok as you but that also the score and the music and that is tremendous um i'm i'm leaning elden ring slightly but uh i want metal hell singer to win just for what it is in this space yeah that's a good thing to point out and and as someone who does sometimes like you know metal music and like some kind of different like versions of hardcore vocalist uh that's really cool what they did with that game but elden ring is it's 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 next level good um it's like up there with like some of the best music in game in a game ever for me so i i assume it will win and i hope it does so i'm going elden ring uh on both cases uh what so obviously you finished god of a ragnarok what to you, what, why is it so clearly Elden Ring by comparison? So, the one like the one track that stuck, sticks out to me the most is like that, like that that main, you know, like Kratos theme or whatever. Yeah. That, like, it's almost like the Batman theme or something. Um, and it hits so hard, and I and I and I freak. I love it so much. Um, but they use it, you know, from it's the same one from 2018, and they use it again here a bit. Um, so. It, it's not, I don't know, I just, Elden Ring just had, like, to me, like, more tracks that stuck out, like, every, like, several different bosses, um, just had different songs that just were, I don't know, just really hit harder to me. Yeah. That, I, c- I couldn't tell you the name of them or anything, but, like, I can hear them in my head. Like, they both the have the quality, but one just on has and... the higher quantity of those high quality. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. That's kind of what I'm feeling. Um, uh, whereas, like, especially when god of war um maybe part of it too is um there's more acting right so i think that kind of True. stands in front of the music yeah. sometimes whereas in elden ring there's no voice acting really um uh certainly not in the same kind of way as in god of war so the music i think plays a bigger role in that game too it is a lot of the emotional hand holding where it, it dictates your emotions in moments whereas like you said in god of war it's the performances that are often doing that in for better or worse, you sometimes forget about the score in the background. So, uh, yeah, I totally right. get that. They're working together more. Uh, Next up, best art direction. We got Elden Ring, God of War Ragnarok, Horizon Forbidden West, Scorn, and Stray. Interesting. Uh, There's some indie games on here that I, I'm kind of bummed aren't on here. Uh, In terms of best art direction... For me, and I don't know if this is fair or not, God of War Ragnarok and Horizon Forbidden West are very beautiful worlds, but they're not too different, generally speaking, than what we saw in their original outings. Um, I think people are scoffing at Scorn being on this. I think it's pretty impressive to make a horror game like almost exclusively inspired by H.R. Geiger 
uh, and it is grotesque, but it is, it is intended. It, it's, it's a world with intention to make you feel gross. And I do think it's unlike anything we've seen. And when I, when I think of art direction, I think of somebody presenting something that is so uniquely itself. Uh, it, we talked about this with Arcane. Uh, I think Arcane is obviously, in terms of art direction, is one of the most beautiful animated shows. You can talk about Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. When it comes to the video games this year, even Stray, I don't think it looks wildly unique. It, it looks great, don't get me wrong, but I don't know if art direction is something I'd applaud Stray for. For me, it's really between Elden Ring and Scorn, uh, and Elden Ring is just a juggernaut, man. That world is so vivid and deep, and the moment when you get down to the underworld, where I'm forgetting the name of it right now because it's been a while since I played Elden Ring, and you see the purple universal sky. There's just so much about that Nocturne game that city exact uh, Necron Eternal City I think or something like Necron, that. Yeah. Uh, I think the thing that from software often gets overlooked for is almost all of their games take place in a dark fantasy world, and those can so easily blend together. But I can so clearly tell the difference between the world of Bloodborne and Dark Souls and even Demon Souls and now Elden Ring. And Elden Ring is obviously it has parts that are uniquely dark souls but it feels also in the same way distinctly itself so i'm gonna go with i'm i think Elden ring is gonna win but for what scorn did i i, I want scorn to win because i think it's so unique in its art direction and what it accomplished yeah to me this is um I, this is like just the easiest thing um so you know you're playing Elden Ring and you're in that Nocturne, Nocturne city or whatever underground and there's stars above you and, and it's like incredible and then then you're fighting this giant spectral deer and then you know before this you know you're in that first um, valley area I forget what it's called when you first start out um, but then later on after you've played this game for like almost 40 hours you get to this Atlas Plateau area that is like the most beautiful like yellow and auburn looking place you've ever found and, and and then you get to the city there that capital city and it's just so incredible how everything looks it's, elden ring is like to me it's just like miles and miles um past everything else in this category <laughs> um almost similar to music because it's like the art direction is, is great but it's just so much different art direction the the different environments that you visit are just so different but also convincing in what they're trying to make it feel like so I'm go. I think Elden Ring wins, and I hope it does, because it's just so damn beautiful in so many different ways. Yeah, a snub that I think could have been here, I think, is Triangle Strategy. I think the HD 2D stuff oh, is yeah. so beautiful, um, and really impressive whenever it's showcased. Um, next up, best narrative. We got a Plague Tale, Requiem, Elden Ring, God of War, Ragnarok, Horizon Forbidden West, and Immortality. Here's the thing. I'm tired of this argument of uh, why is Elden Ring in this category? Because people believe that the uh, only way a narrative can be told is through linear storytelling. And you know, I don't know. It's just, it's a tired argument, man. It's, I'm already over it. Um, that being said, earlier, what did I think that Immortality had a chance to win for was best performance? I do think Immortality has a chance here because of the narrative it did in such a unique way. Um, but... I do think it really comes down to God of War, Ragnarok, and Elden Ring, as most awards do. And I love Elden Ring's narrative, and I do think it does belong in this category. But in terms of what God of War, Ragnarok brings, I do think it's that elevated storytelling that people are kind of thirsty for in video games now. And I do think from what I've heard, obviously non-spoiler, but from what I've heard, what people completing it is that it, it does feel like the second half that fulfills the story of the first game and uh you know even from the opening moments when you are introduced to thor and odin having those discussions and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the podcast of just the conversations and the palpable tension and all of that i just i think it's god of war ragnarok but i wouldn't be surprised if Elden ring wins and man would the internet riot because Apparently, it's not even supposed to be in this category. But yeah, I'm going to go God of War Ragnarok does win. But I do want Immortality to win. Because I, I do think that that game deserves to get recognition for what it brought. For how distinct and unique it was. So. Yeah. Um, the story in Ragnarok is... First of all, this is a category where it's hard to separate it, I think, from the first game. Because it, 
you know, in, in some cases, I think it made sense how we talked about it, where, you know, they, they, for art direction, you know, it, we're visiting a lot of the same worlds from the first game. So it's harder for me to want to, you know, vote for it again, basically. Um, but for story, it's a, it's one part of a two part story. So like they're kind of you can't really separate them in, in regards of story and and it's just it's really it's carried a lot by the acting too. So it's kind of also hard to separate it. It's the same story with different actors, you know, it just wouldn't be the same. Um, but it's just so good and it feels t- together. It feels like an epic. It feels like a Lord of the Rings trilogy in it, or a Star Wars. Um, kind of a thing so without obviously getting into details but the, to me god of war is going to win this one and and i think it should i i, I would certainly wear what i think will win and what i hope wins uh next up best game direction we have Elden Ring, god of war ragnarok horizon forbidden west immortality and stray uh i think this is going to be Elden Ring. i i in terms of specifically game direction it's amazing that Elden Ring even exists. The scope of it, the depth of it, I, I just think it, I don't know. Miyazaki is a genius. He always has been. He always will be. And, um, you know, I do want to mention, obviously, we've seen all of the reports about crunch and stuff that shouldn't go unnoted. Um, but we also have to take into account that, obviously, it's a different culture and they handle things differently. We can't really push our, 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 our Western ideas of of that of workplace culture and stuff on on other people not to say that it's like good but you know just take it with a grain of salt um yeah i think it's very clearly Elden Ring. i think god of War ragnarok and horizon forbidden west will suffer in this category from the sequel perspective uh, unfortunately um once again like i've said before numerous times with the immortality i think game direction what they did with it is impressive with the movies and 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 the way that whole game is structured Stray, it's a good it's a good game from what I've heard. But even to you, what you said, a lot of it is there's not a whole lot of innovation necessarily in that game. So I don't know if people would be willing to throw it in the ring as best game direction overall. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go. I, I think and I hope Elden Ring wins. Yeah, when I think back to Elden Ring, how it how the world just makes you want to explore it, and I don't know. I don't. I, it's hard to even like put into words sometimes. But it did that thing that Breath of the Wild did, where it just incentivizes you in in the most unique way to want to go explore things. But it did it even better than Breath of the Wild. Um, and and then to your point, like the fact that it it even works, that it all exists, like the way it all comes together is in- incredibly impressive. Especially like when we think about that game came out on just about every platform, right? Xbox One and PS4 and five and series x and pc and all the variations of all those consoles and like i feel like there weren't really technical issues at all and i don't know this to me is just it's right in the uh right in the bread basket of what this award should be for and mostly because of like you said for horizon and god of war god of war i could have totally you know i would expect this to have won it in 2018 when the game first came out when the first game came out um but it's in terms of you know direction and like gameplay design it's not not innovative enough compared to compared to Elden Ring at least um and same for Horizon and then Stray I I can't understand to be honest why it's in this category but yeah so I think Elden Ring wins this and I hope it does yeah instead of Stray I would love to see like Cult of the Lamb where it mixes the simulation community building with the roguelike i think that's much more interesting in terms of game direction than stray Mm -hmm. so uh, yeah it is a little weird that it's on there um now we got the big boy game of the year plague tale requiem elden ring god of war ragnarok horizon forbidden west stray and xenoblade chronicles i'm gonna be honest no hit on stray i don't know why it's here i don't get that (laughs) Uh, even in terms of just looking at indie games i don't think it was the most notable indie game uh I know that Game Awards likes to kind of um, put a spotlight on at least. There's usually always one indie game in the game of the year, which I appreciate. And yeah, I don't, my opinion, even though I haven't played it, I don't think Stray's indie game that should be here. But, you know, what am I to say? I didn't play it. It's a a two-game race here, Elden Ring and God of War Ragnarok. And I really believe that Elden Ring is going to win it. And uh, I want it to win it. Uh, But if God of War Ragnarok won, I'd be just as happy with but. 
Yeah, I just think Elden Ring is so special. Uh, I mean, both those games are so special. It's a very tough year. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to say Elden Ring wins it, and I wanted to win it. Yeah, this is really hard because, if, you know, pick your favorite kid or whatever. Um, because they're both so good, and they excel at different things. <laughs> so it, it's not even like you can... It, it's hard to make one-to-one -one comparisons. It's like, yeah, the story uh, is is has more more is more emotional and hits me hit me harder in God of War, right? Where you know we're at points where I was like gritting my teeth and hyped and like ready to do shit, and also other points that you know where I'm like tearing up and I'm like, oh, and other points where I'm just like so, you know, um, impressed with the acting and 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 how the characters have grown and different things like all, all that kind of stuff and then it's just really fun to play and find stuff and all that good stuff too but then elden ring just did something to me that was like i don't know it's just different like i talked about breath of the wild earlier where like they kind of started this thing of this new way to create an open world and new way to incentivize people to explore it and then elden ring i feel like took that formula and just you know launched themselves to the moon with it and it's awesome so I do want Elden Ring to win. Um, that's what I hope wins. I don't... I'm split between what I think will win, though, because when I look back, God of War 2018 had to beat out both Spider-Man and Red Dead 2 to win Game of the Year that year, and it did it. Really impressive. Obviously, both really great... All three really great games, but God of War came out on top there. But also, from software... <laughs> is known to win some Game of the Year awards themselves at, at this show, right? Sekiro won um, Game of the Year. So common knowledge might have you, you know, had us thinking that year, I think, that, like, it's, it was too niche, it's too difficult, it can't win. Um, but I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, I do think Elden Ring does ultimately win Game of the Year here. Again, back to that sequel thing for Ragnarok. I think that that's what gives it the edge. Elden Ring was just... A little bit more new, a little bit more innovative and unique than Ragnarok. So I think it wins, and I sure hope it does too. We're also talking about global impact, and we're looking at a game that sold 5 million copies, which is also super impressive, to a game that's closing on an 18 million copies, uh, Good point. which yeah. is absolutely insane. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be tough. It's a coin toss, but yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm back in Elden Ring along with you. Uh, so here's what the tiebreaker is going to be, Dom, in case we tie on points. So the question is, you're going to be picking over under, and you're going to choose, and I'm going to get whatever you don't choose. I came up with the question. It's only fair that you get to choose which side of it you want. So will the game that takes home the most awards, the single game that takes home the most awards at the end of the night from the Game Awards, win over or under three and a half total awards? And for those who don't know, it's a half because when you're choosing over or under, you have to have a viable over or under. So it's he's choosing if it's going to have three or less or four or more. Hmm. And then I'll be stuck with the or, opposite of what you choose. Damn. Ah, that's tough. Four is a that's a lot, dude. There's so many things that I think get split, and I think so many people end up voting. You know, I think people are going to do that thing where they voted. You know, Elden Ring Game of the Year. So for direction, they've got a war to kind of like level it out. So that's going to make it tough in my eyes for something to get to four. So I'm going to say under, under three. Okay, so I have the over with four. So if God of War Elden Ring wins four awards. But remember, that's a tiebreaker. So if we if we don't even tie on points, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, Next up, we're going to do our predictions. But I want some notes here so everyone's caught up on all of the reports and news about the Game Awards. One, Ed Boon has already confirmed NetherRealm's next game won't show up. People were thinking it might be a possibility because that's where the latest Mortal Kombat was revealed. Two, Hideo Kojima continues to tease his next project. Obviously, he's good friends with Jeff Keighley, so it's highly likely we see his, his project with Dakota Fanning or whoever it was that he's been teasing. Three, Tekken 8 is all but confirmed to appear. Uh, the studio and the publisher have both been kind of teasing it. It's pretty heavy-handed that it's going to be there. Uh, according to insiders, Diablo 4 is set to have a big announcement. It's unclear if it's related to the release date or the highly anticipated beta, but it's pretty much all but confirmed that Diablo 4 is going to be there. And lastly, confirmed special guests include uh, Noki Yoshida, who's the producer of Final Fantasy XIV, and Hayes Light Studios founder Joseph Ferris. 
Uh, obviously, just because they're appearing doesn't mean they're going to be showcasing any games, but keep that in mind. So we're going to go with our predictions. We were both uh, come prepared with five. I have mine in ascending order from most plausible to most wild, Dom. I'll start. We'll go back and forth. I have some extras, we, and you do too, that we can talk about, uh, or if I need to replace one of them with something you come up with. So I'll go first. Uh, Elden Ring DLC revealed, uh, slated for winter 2023, spring 2023, so sometime early next year. Uh, obviously, we've seen the close relationship from Software has had with uh, Jeff Keighley. Also, in terms of marketing, having Elden Ring out there with all these award nominees you know marketing the dlc at this event is also a really smart move to make especially for a, a publisher that's not as huge as obviously some of the other players in the industry so that's my first prediction hmm. it, it was tempting to you know want to go all out and pick some crazy stuff here but i wanted to try to stay sane i guess so i think we'll see a trailer for dlc for gotham knights because why not? <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have one related to Jedi Survivor? No, that was the other thing. I wanted, like, that's, like, all but confirmed, even though it's not been officially confirmed. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm not bothering with that. Same with, I feel like, Final Fantasy sixteen. It seems like that's certainly going to happen. Maybe not, but I wanted to, I didn't I didn't think it was fair to pick that, because it seems like, oh, like there's so many rumors. So, uh, this doesn't count. I'm going to give you my official second one, but the one I had written down originally was Jedi Survivor gets a story specific trailer and the March, 2023 release date gets spe specified to a specific date. I'm not going to actually use that one. That's just one I had written down. The actual one I'm going to go with is, uh, to keep in line with you. I think suicide squad kills the justice league gets a new trailer and it's, uh, it gets announced for summer 2023. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think they want to move past Gotham Knights as soon as possible and get people excited for the next DC thing. So, Especially with no uh, DC dome or whatever the hell happening this year either. Um, okay. This isn't like as fun, but I'm going to try to win this one. I want to get these right. So <laughs> I have some kind of more mild predictions next i'm gonna say we're gonna see a trailer for some genshin impact expansion whatever okay be paying great. the bills got that pay the bills thing <laughs> uh yeah. my third one like, you know that's got to happen right like go on it's like a 50 50 yeah uh i'm gonna i'm gonna say two real quick they don't count they're just ones i had listed that i'm not gonna use anymore a uh, hellblade 2 send you a saga gets extended gameplay segment i think it's possible but it's not really that fun and uh horizon forbidden west dlc expansion slated for spring 2023 i have those written down don't count but we'll see what those happen my actual next one uh civ 7 announcement trailer i don't know if we'll see gameplay or anything but i do think it's about time i was looking into this civ uh uh 6 came out in 2016 which is six years ago oh, and civ 5 came out in 2010 so 2022 from 2016 seems about the time in which you would get a civ 7 announcement um so yeah i'm, I'm banking on that And Jeff Keighley does yeah. a good job of having a, a a swath of genres of game announcements. So I do think he'd be stoked to get a Civ, the Civ 7 announcement. Okay, next I'm going to I'm going to get a little more exciting here. Nothing too wild, but I'm going to say we're going to see a trailer for Dragon's Dogma 2 from Capcom. Should be fun. Do we get a date or no? No. no. Uh next up, we're going to get uh ooh, let's see here. Which one am I going to do? I'm going to go with this one. This is my fourth one. Uh, Marvel's Spider-Man 2 trailer, dated for 2023. I'll even go as far as to say fall 2023. And, but the big thing about this trailer is we're going to see the official first look at Venom's design in this world. Because we got the tease of him in the first trailer, but we don't know what he ac actually looks like in this uh, version of, of the Spider-Man universe. So that's my fourth. That will be pretty hype. And I really hope that happens. <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> what's your what's your fourth uh, prediction because we saw it or like we heard his voice but he was in the shadows and we couldn't actually see it him was like cascaded like an alleyway yeah we just saw his shadow with like light mm -hmm. next i'll say i really i wanted to do something fun like um i thought about saying you know Dwayne the rock johnson will be on stage for some reason but <laughs> um i won't say that we do know um, pedro pascal and um uh what's who, what's the actress's name that plays the on mormont 
Bella Ramsey. Bella Ramsey. They're both going to be there, so we might get a new That's Last cool. of Us trailer, which is sick. That's really cool. I look forward to that. Um, no, I'm going to stay mild again. Um, because I don't... I don't think we get... I want. I wish we could. I could say that we're gonna get a trailer for like the multiplayer Last of Us game, but because we just saw like you know that promo art or whatever from yeah, Summer Kiwi's Summer Game Fest, and that was it. And they said it was still working. They're still far off. I don't think it's time yet. I wish I could say it was, but instead I'm gonna say we see a trailer for Marvel Snap, and it's gonna be introducing some new characters that haven't been in the game yet. If that makes sense. Do you have any other ones? Because I want to help you out on this one because they just recently announced like a bunch of brand new stuff coming to the game in a video and new cards. Okay. So the chance of it appearing okay. at the Game Awards is probably not likely. <laughs> okay. I, I keep up a little bit more um, with the game than you do, so I just want to bail you out on that one. Like, go with something else. That's why I slowed down at the end there thinking <laughs> to myself, maybe they have all the characters they already need in this game or something. I don't know, because I still haven't messed around with it yet. But I do have... I'll, I'll say another good one I think could happen is a release or a trailer including a release date for alan wake 2 and it'll be shoot that game doesn't already have a release date does it i don't know that's a good question maybe 2023 <laughs> i think they just said next year but i'm gonna double check yeah so they just they've only said 2023 so they're gonna say it's gonna be um summer 2023 i hope the game comes out in october oh man i hope the game comes out in october uh that would be cool. I'm going to throw out... So this is my final one. These two are not ones that are going to count, and then I'll give you my actual final one. Uh, the other two I had listed were Dragon Age 4 gameplay reveal, which I would love to see, and uh, Hollow Knight Silk Song release date, which I would also love to see. Those two are speaking from the heart, yeah. but those are my official ones. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do this as a split one because I do think both these are unlikely, but if you think it's I should only stick with one of them, you can let me know. I think we're either going to get the announcement, and this is my most wild dreamlike prediction, we're going to get the announcement of either a Banjo-Kazooie remake or a Fallout New Vegas remake. I think Xbox is going to showcase a remake that comes out, because I do think we're in the stage where we're waiting for their exclusives, their new exclusives to come out, and I think a new way to, and a, a creative way to kind of fill in the gaps for Game Pass releases is to green light remakes of classic games people love and if they're not going to license out fallout to one of their other studios in the meantime uh i think the or rare is not going to come up with a new banjo i think the best thing to do is find either a secondary team for those studios or a third team they can partnership with to make those remakes and kind of just bring them into the modern era so one of those i would be absolutely down with that yeah but wouldn't bet on it myself. Uh, well, the Fallout New Vegas though. one has legs. There's rumors floating about that. The re remake of oh, that. Really? Yeah. Oh, the Banjo Kazooie one is Ooh. completely outlandish on my part. But with the recent thing of them being in Smash, and I just think that it's an easy win. I don't think, not saying remaking games from the ground up is easy, but in the grand scope of it, I do think Banjo Kazooie, from what it presents from a gameplay perspective, is relatively easy as a project to green light and remake if that you know what i mean like replacing assets mm -hmm. it's pretty much just a platformer quality of life stuff not saying it's easy but i do think in the grand scheme it's easier of what they could remake so give me a psychonauts remake right, the first one. psychonauts is so good double fine green light a psychonauts one remake that would be yeah cool. that and it would be worth it um all right i got one more for you um because it has to happen eventually. It has to. We know it's coming, but like, where is it? We're gonna have finally get a trailer and a release date for Metroid Prime Trilogy, you know, remasters for Switch, and they're gonna be in. They're gonna come out in March. We're gonna find out about it at the Game Awards release. Okay. You got any wow. bonus ones that don't count, but you wanted to mention any others that don't count? Yeah, Bloodborne <laughs> remastered gets announced. The one I'm surprised neither of us came up with. Neither of us said anything about the new Bioshock. I think that could is totally plausible to show up too. I thought about it too. In fact, I think I predicted it either last year or for Summer Games Fest this past summer. I don't know. It's one that's, you know, just like a Bloodborne remake or a sequel to that. It's like, it's gotta happen. I, I would assume it's gotta happen. We know Bioshock 4 is happening, but like, who knows what how it's going. 
It might. I feel like it's struggling. And then. Uh, I do think another one okay. that we that are, is possible, but obviously kind of not sure is neither of us mentioned Avowed or Fable. Um, oh, uh, Yacht Club Games next game, Mina the Hollower could totally show up. That would be. Sick. Yeah. Oh, can't wait for that. Dude, you know what would be super awesome? Out of nowhere, if they revealed the next 2D Zelda, or maybe not 2D, but like handheld Zelda, that'd be super sick. Also, where the hell's Mario? Where's my new Mario game? Odyssey 2, I've been waiting for it yeah. forever. Dude, there's gotta be a That one Mario could be possible right? solely be. for the fact of the new movie, too. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Also, did you have you seen the second trailer? Yeah, it's really Dude, cool. Dude, Mario wow, Kart, awesome. we can have a whole conversation about that. Yeah. I'm really excited about that movie, and I think that has a chance to be yeah. a best adaptation next year at the Game Awards. Mm -hmm. Though it won't win, because Last yeah. of Us exists, but... <laughs> you know <laughs> oh yeah that's that, that that's a good matchup right there though. yeah uh anyways that's it for our predictions uh we'll see what happens like i said this is gonna be our last podcast for the year thank you guys for joining us we'll see what happens like i said when we return from our holiday break we might be a couple of pounds heavier depending on how holiday dinner goes but uh we're gonna be looking at we're gonna go over our uh results for this we're gonna go over our yearly predictions which man i can't wait to see how those age dom can't wait to see 12 months later how those 2022 predictions age. Uh, we're going to be going over our uh, Fantasy Critics League as well. Though, depending on how bulky going over all of our predictions are, we might end up doing the following episode, Dom. I thought we could do Fantasy Critics League review for last year and then start up our one for the next year. I think it would be pretty cool to do them both in the same episode maybe. Yeah. And then also look out for our spoiler cast. Uh, I don't know how much time we're going to spend real quick on what we've been playing, but... I haven't been able to get to God of War too much, unfortunately. Dom, you beat it, which I want to hear a little bit non-spoiler thoughts on real quick. But the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, I've been playing a bunch of Vampire Survivors, uh, which is oh, yeah. tremendous. That game is so addicting. I talked about it last week, I believe. And then Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, I'm having a blast with. Uh, some of the new Pokemon designs are really cool and interesting. Some of them are super ugly, but that is Pokemon. Uh, the funniest uh, criticism, some people are like, this Pokemon just looks like an animal. What's much different about it? As if, like, Seal and Dugong from the original Pokemon weren't just white seals. Like, there's a bunch of examples throughout Pokemon of that. It, it's just that Gen 1 bias. I have it sometimes. I'm I'm guilty of it, but come on now. Uh, but the game's a blast. There's so many. Uh, real quick, the cool thing about the game, Dom, is not only is it you can approach the eight gym leaders any way you want. The core of the game is basically Harry Potter in that you exist in a school. The central hub is a school. You don't start the game by going to the professor's house and getting your Pokemon and all that stuff. It's a little bit different there. But there's also, like, kids who abandon the school to form their own, like, renegade Pokemon teams that you kind of have to go and take out around the world, too. And then there's also these giant, like, malformed Pokemon that you're investigating of why they're giant in comparison to the other Pokemon of the same species. So there's literally, like, three story paths you can go down. And I'm kind of doing them interchangeably as I'm, like, exploring the map really cool there's a lot of content in it that's uh engaging in its own way and i'm having a blast with it and uh anybody out there you should choose violet over scarlet because the main one of the main mechanics in the game dom is the legendary pokemon in this game they're motorcycles okay one's from the past and one's from the future and there's actually forms of pokemon called paradox pokemon that are it's like a rhyhorn from the future so it looks completely different uh or from the past which is a really neat concept so it's like it's you see the evolution over time, right? So you can see like an older version of this Pokemon or a futuristic version of it. Uh, and it's only for a, a set amount of Pokemon. Anyways, the reason you choose Violet over Scarlet Dom is because Scarlet's motorcycle is this dumb red dragon, goofy ass looking thing that doesn't look necessarily like a motorcycle that you ride around with. But Violet's is like a, per you need to look it up. It's like a, a purple futuristic motorcycle with like jet fuel coming out of the back. Like, they both look goofy, don't get me wrong, but comparing the two, it's much cooler, and it feels so dope to ride around on this, like, futuristic motorcycle as opposed to the red one, which looks like this goofy, weird thing. It, they're, they, yeah, you're right. It looks like the Pokemon just is on top of a motorcycle, like straddling Exactly, it. whereas the purple one is, like, a cool-ass motor. It looks, it, they can't, they don't compare. One looks way cooler than the other. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Anyways, that's it for me in terms of what I've been playing. Nothing of note. Uh, hopefully, I can get to more God of War, Ragnarok. 
I'm going to beat it by by the time we come back for sure. But I'm saying in the immediate future, I want to dive in as much as possible. You real quick, I know you don't want to spoil anything, but overall thoughts on completing the game. How long did it take you? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What, it, a month, almost. <laughs> um, I don't know how many hours. I think at least 30. I think it was somewhere in that range. Um, I kind of like mainline the story after the first, you know, couple side quests. Um, as I think got more serious, I was like, no, nah, I'm, I want to, I need to see how this ends. Uh, I have a question and, for you. Is it pretty yeah. easy to get back in there after you beat it to go and do all the side stuff and all of that? Or does it do the thing yes. where it sets you before the ending of the game again? No, it, the game ends and then it, it narratively makes perfect sense that you can to continue and explore and clean stuff up. Gotcha. Okay. Um, what I will say is it it's kind of a pain in the ass because uh, backtracking into some of these levels, it's not just easy to figure out how you got to places. It's incredibly like a it's very much like a labyrinth in a lot of cases. When you go back to Vanaheim and oh, it's this jungle and it's so hard to figure out how you got to this place that you were at before, where you, or how to get to here. It's it, I don't know. It's fun the first time you're going through. But trying to backtrack is just a huge pain. Um, even with the map is okay, but it, it should be better, in my opinion. You have any intention like, of platinuming it? Experience. Yeah, I'm working on okay. it. I'm gonna. Um, I'm close, but yeah, it reminds me a lot of um, Jedi Fallen Order, where like trying to go back and get the collectibles in that game kind of was tedious. Um, although that map was better because it was at least three dimensional. Like you could at least like it- rotate it around and stuff like that. You could see like where little secret passageways were but in this map it's just kind of like it's just a top level map so you can't necessarily tell where exactly yeah well i have one last question for you um since you've beat it and i'm nowhere close is there anything you wish you knew or would have done that you can tell like any tips you'd give me since i i'm have a lot more of the game to look towards i don't know i don't think so i mean it's not overly difficult. There's nothing that like you could miss. Um, it's kind of just yeah, just play it and just enjoy the story and enjoy the the characters and the acting. I guess yeah. Uh, one last it's thing is like it a, very clear how like obviously early in the game it's pretty easily defined what the side objectives are. Like it's like we need to go to this specific location, but if you look over here, you can do this. Does it continue that so I know to how yep. to mainline it? Yep. Okay, cool. It does that. It's really cool how it does that. And even too, you'll finish up like a main quest or something, and then just the way the way where the story sits, the characters will say, you know, Mimir will say like, "Well, yep, we're we're gonna go do that next, but we got some time to kill. So if you want to go over here and check out this stuff, we can." Like they literally tell you. Um, I really love how they do that, and it it makes perfect narrative sense when it happens. Um, as opposed to like you know, a lot of games when you're like. Oh, I'm going to go do this side quest. And then it's like, yeah, but the world is ending in your main <laughs> yeah. quest. So why would you ever deviate? But in this game, that's not the case. They do a good job at solving that problem. Did you have any trouble or feel the need to have to constantly upgrade your gear? Or like, oh, damn, I forgot I upgraded. That's why I'm fighting a wall right now. No, I never really got to that. I, I played on like the regular middle difficulty and nothing ever felt. Um, Were you at a min-max or anything? It, yeah nothing like that it's it, at worst it's like you need you might die a few times on a certain um boss not even boss but like some of the optional bosses these berserkers and just learning the mechanics or getting or caught by accident yeah yeah it's definitely not an overly difficult game um so if that's what you're looking for definitely bump up the difficulty oh no 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 i'm i'm in it like. for the story man i'm on the same difficulty you're at yeah. i'm not looking for a fight no, i don't want no smoke uh, anything else you wanna yeah, you wanna talk about this game before we head out on holiday break? I don't think so. Um, I really want to get into all the spoilery stuff, so I'm looking forward to to when we do that. I do. I did play one other thing though, to, to completion, and I want to mention is Visage. Oh my goodness, the hands down, just no debate, scariest game I've ever played, and maybe the scariest game that's ever existed. Just unbelievably terrifying and is this the one i talked to you about cult yeah it, it is so i went and got it it was on sale and my wife and i played through it and oh my goodness it's there's no combat um it's mostly puzzles and exploring this house but 
it is so terrifying in different kinds of ways than most games and it's really difficult sometimes obtusely so sometimes where i think it's it needs it to give you a little bit more guidance because you're like how would i have ever known that putting this picture on the wall here does this yeah stupid stuff like that where it's like that adventure game stuff where you're like you had had have had no way of knowing um so i do fault it for that but some of that also um makes it scarier because uh you're not quite exactly sure where to go and the way that the lights work in the house and it's just oh it's for if you're into like extremely terrifying games and horror stuff in general like you have to play this i I would say even for its faults um you have to check it out it's like one of the most memorable gaming experiences i've ever had um mostly mostly for better but obviously it's very niche (laughs) you don't go near it if you're not into spooky shit would you agree with me that that it is very clearly inspired by pt and does the execution of that like really i think it's the closest thing to pt we've gotten in terms of vibe of a horror game since pt i think so um it never gets too at times it gets abstract where like you know things are psychological and changing on you um and i normally don't like when shit gets too into that because i feel like well you could just make up any rules you want it's not as fun um but it never it never goes too far into that to where like i didn't I, I didn't or i hated it i guess um but overall it's very pt like um you know i never played pt that demo anyway can't anymore but from what i had seen of it um it, it's it's similar but even i think less abstract which i prefer and i think this is a beautiful example of so for people out there who might not like playing horror games and just want to check out this game i highly suggest a scary game squad playthrough of this game because those guys are hilarious and this game is great but that's how i watch it for the first time because i don't follow horror games all that closely not that i don't play them it's just not a genre i like naturally flow to like you but this is a perfect example of like just because you haven't played something if you experience enough of it and you understand like one of your friends will dig it try to recommend it because you never know like i never played this game i just watched those guys play through it but i was like damn this is a dumbass game and that's why i recommended it to you yeah. and i'm glad that you ended that up digging it on. yeah so that's cool yeah i just can't ir- iterate enough that it's like very hardcore just be careful <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's it for this year's Controlled Interest Gamecast. We'll be back next year with all of the stuff I talked about. Um, yeah, excited for all the games coming out next year. Obviously, we'll have a preview episode talking about all the games for 2023, at least the ones we know about. Uh, but the cool thing is hopefully we'll have more games already slated for 2023 post-Game Awards, Dom, that we can talk. Fingers crossed Hollow Knight gets released date and all the other games we mentioned. Yes. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you guys in 2023. See you then. Bye.